Hello and welcome to Brooks TV. I'm Sam Swinnerton. And I'm Sarah Longson. First on today's news is the extreme weather that's hitting the country. Oxford in particular has seen a large amount of flooding that's led to road closures and damage to properties. Many people and businesses have been affected and many locals feel that the damage could be avoided. They're calling on the council to focus on prevention rather than a cure. But is there really a solution to the problem? Our reporter Danny Batt investigates. With this being the scene of serious flooding a few weeks ago, Botley Road was closed. As you can see, it's currently open, but for how long? With rain forecast for the next week, I investigate what is being done about the flooding in this area. Back in 2007, when Oxford was severely flooded, the Environment Agency came up with the idea of a flood relief channel which would take the water away from the affected area. Leader of Oxford City Council Bob Price has put in a bid to the government of £160 million to back this relief channel. I spoke to him at Oxford Town Hall. The Western Conveyance Project is a project designed to take water from uh, the north of the Oxford catchment area in Godstow uh, around the west of the city uh, to around about the Sanford Lock. So it would actually effectively act as a storm drain for surplus water coming down the Thames, take it around the city centre, away from the uh, uh, houses and shops, and dump it south of the city. The estimates vary. When it was first costed, it was costed at around about 150 million. But more recently, the Environment Agency had done more work on it, and their view, I think, is that it can be delivered now for between 120 and 130,000 pounds on so a million pounds on the uh, current basis. Former Binsey boatyard manager and stand-up paddleboard instructor Tom Balance thinks he has a more manageable solution to the problem, which he recently discussed with Nicola Blackwood MP. I propose trying to use the A34, which bridges right across the, the Thames flood barrier. Um, as a partial barrier to help Oxford um, with the flooding. Well, I think as a, as a part of a plan, rather than coming up with one big canal that sorts out the whole solution, I think we should be looking back at our ancestors, what they did, how they made things, because if you look locally, I, I could show you some very interesting things. And if you do lots of little things together, in other words, basically maintenance, but with a few innovative ideas such as this, I think it could make all the difference to Oxford. Peter Walcliffe from Oxford Flood Alliance said, His idea would need to be evaluated by a professional hydrologist. The Western Conveyance, a new water course, is designed to relieve Oxford of the blight of flooding every two to three years, reducing it to one flood every 75 years. It is the only plan on the table and it is absolutely vital for Oxford. To prevent such severe flooding in the future, something has to be done soon. This is Danny Batt reporting for Brooks TV News. It's fascinating that people appear to be suggesting lots of solutions, but nobody seems to be fixing the problem. Yes, and now the Met Office is forecasting that a month's worth of rain is going to fall in the next week, so the situation is only going to get worse. Well, these issues are tough for us all, but it's especially hard on the homeless here in Oxfordshire. The council has recently announced proposed cuts to the housing-related support budget. This has left local organisations feeling concerned about the welfare of those who are sleeping rough. Katie McKay investigates. With the UK recently experiencing abnormal weather conditions, most of us have sheltered from the storms in the comfort of our own homes. But for many people in Oxford, this is a luxury that they soon may be without. As the government plans to slash the housing-related budget by 38%, many former homeless families and individuals currently braving the weather in local shelters may be back on the streets. The Council have released the following statement. The Council's plan is to save £1.5 million on the housing-related support. The government grant to Oxfordshire for this has steadily reduced each year, but Oxfordshire County Council has been topping up this reduction. The Council would work closely with partners and providers to develop ideas about how the remaining housing-related budget could be spent. 
I went along to Oxford Homeless Pathways, a local shelter, and spoke to the chief executive and one of the residents to find out their opinion on the current situation. We're really, really worried about these cuts. 38% is an awful lot of money to lose from budgets. Um, and it, this wouldn't affect just my organisation, it would affect all the other services that support homeless people in Oxford. So the knock-on effect, um, regardless of how they apportion those cuts, would be disastrous for homeless people. What happened at the protest you went along to? Well, it was great. So many people came. We had a, a, around 300 people, I think, came to support us. Um, lots of people from other organisations, homeless people, um, pu members of the public who just wanted to support us, a lot of students. And um, we were really able to express how we felt. I got to the protest for the speeches and I got to hear Leslie, who's the CEO for here, um, speaking. And she was saying that one in ten people statistically become homeless. And she looked at the board and said, because there was ten of them, one of you by statistics will become homeless so it was really really good and we were all cheering. With no knowing if the proposed cuts will be passed the idea of the budget slash may just be the beginning of destruction soon to devastate Oxford's homeless. I'm Katie McKay reporting for Brooks TV News. Many students can be seen around campus playing games on their mobile phones. Yes and before it was taken down by the owner Flappy Bird was the latest game that everybody was playing. Well, some of the games that you might be playing on your phone may have been developed here in Oxford. Danny Spateri reports on the state of gaming in Oxfordshire and the multi-million dollar sale of natural motion games. To those who follow the gaming industry, Oxford has long been associated with trendsetting game development. With studios like Exeunt and Rebellion, there is a strong pedigree of Oxford games. Zynga have just purchased Oxfordshire-based game developer Natural Motion Games for $391 million in cash, as well as a further $39.8 million in Zynga shares. Natural Motion Games, which includes former Brooks students, is best known for its mobile app, Clumsy Ninja, which had 10 million downloads in its first week on iOS. While this is potentially good news for the studio, the news did come with a bitter aftertaste as it was announced that 15% of the staff would be losing their jobs. This equates to 314 employees across the company. A report from market research firm Comscore in 2013 revealed that there are 20 million monthly active mobile gamers in the UK. Industry analyst IHS Screen Digest claimed that in 2013, Brit spent nearly £300 million on mobile games. Uh, the only game that I play on my Blackberry is poker, just to kill the time. Um, I used to play The Sims, but um, no, generally I don't really have time anymore. So well, I play it occasionally at night, when I'm not too busy, uh, mostly uh, Candy Crush, so it's great fun. Oxford Brooks runs a computer game and animation course, as well as hosting the Computer Vision Group which worked together with Sony to produce the Wonder Book. The Computer Vision Group were vital in creating the software to work with Sony's PlayStation Move. The future of the games industry in Oxford is uncertain, but for the apps that will come out of natural motion games, it will be a race to the top of the charts. This is Danny Spiteri reporting for Brooks TV News. Now, as we all know, in 2012, university tuition fees almost tripled from £3,290 to over £9,000. The decision led to the student riots in London in 2010. Many students currently studying at Brooks are already paying the increased fee. I know several people who were almost put off coming to university when they realised the debt that they will be leaving with. Well, there's talk from those in the education sector about raising fees again. Professor Petford from Northampton University is the third Vice-Chancellor to speak up about the demand for higher fees. But are these costs becoming too much for new students to stomach? Luke Crumplin went to find out. Every year, thousands of students send off applications in the hope of securing a place at university. But with the rise of tuition fees since 2012, are applicants being put off higher education? I think that the new student fees will mean that some people might not go to university. I don't think it's really going to affect us because we're not going to see it come out of our bank accounts anyway. But to be honest, I think they actually are quite a bad thing because it can close opportunities to people you know, to go on, get a degree in, and uh, for their prospects to be better. To be honest, like the way you pay it back, like you pay it in bits and bobs, I don't think it will affect you that much, but I guess it depends on your situation. But for me, it hasn't really affected me. So the final application deadline for UCAS was the middle of January. 
Students now have to wait and see if they are offered a place or not. UCAS releases annual statistics showing the total applications of the previous academic year. The data shows that applications have increased between 2013 and 2014, but still fall short of 2011, one of the highest intakes on record, and was the last year before tuition fees were set to rise. UCAS stated, the introduction of tuition fees reduced the level of application rate, but did not materially alter the medium-term trend of annual increases in the level of 18-year-old demand for higher education. I'm here at Newland Girls School, where like many other schools, they encourage students to pursue higher education, despite the increased fees. Don't be put off by fees. Uh, everybody's going to be in the same boat. Uh, these are uh, things that can, you know, that, that can be handled um, through the rest of your life for however many years um, because you know you're going to be earning a certain salary before you have to pay them back anyway, that kind of thing. So I think, I think the messages that came from the universities themselves when they came into school and therefore that staff have continued to give to students is, um, is to certainly not be put off by the fees. Everybody's in the same boat, very much in a sense like taking out a mortgage in life. This is something that financially everybody's going to have to deal with at some point. Uh, and it's just going to be a common, a common part of life now. Not all potential students focus on the financial side, but rather the career prospects and social lifestyle that university boasts. I think it's just the whole fact that you have to be independent and it's just good because it kind of prepares you for like later life and, um, and you get to meet new friends and you get to learn new things, so I think it's, it would be a good experience. It's so hard and competition has gone so up. So you go uni, spend so much money, and then I'm not even guaranteed a job. Next year, we'll see the first graduates leave with over £30,000 of debt. Yet university still seems a popular choice, even with the increased chance that the fees will never be paid off. This is Luke Crumplin, reporting for Brooks TV News. That's it for this half of the show, but join us after the break when, we'll, we, when we will be grilling the Brooks Union president, Joel Holmes, about the safety bus and the poor reputation of the students' union. We'll see you soon. Welcome back to the show. Here at Brooks TV, we like to have our ear to the ground so we can find out about the issues that affect students. Earlier this week, Ed Templer met with Joel Holmes, the Brooks Union president, to raise some of the issues that affect you. Joel, thank you very much for joining us. No problem. Uh, what have been the highlights at Brooks Union for you over the last three years? Um, there's been quite a few. I mean, highlights personally, I think some of the big shows that we've been involved in, the children in need I was involved in over the past two years, raising a lot of money, having a lot of fun. Um, but more than that, I think um, this year we've really pushed on. The statistics show that we've um, saved nearly half a million pounds um, from students um, over, over the past three years, and that's growing all the time. And what will that half a million pounds be uh, used to help? I mean, will that that will help the that, students? That, that is um, preventing students spending that. So that's coming out of their own pockets otherwise. But coming to us for advice, they've basically um, saved that. So the better off and can go on more holidays. Brilliant. Well, uh, what long-term improvements have you guys got planned for the Student Union? Obviously, the new building is a game-changer completely. Um, it's going to enable us to be a more visible face on campus. Um, it's got better, newer facilities. Um, we're going to be able to offer a lot more. We've got a bar in there, which is obviously the big question that most people ask about. Um, so you can go for a quick chill-out in between seminars. Um, and that's going to basically enable us to, um, I reckon, improve NSS scores simply by the fact that people know where we are, they see us on a regular basis, and then hopefully we'll use our services more. Speaking of your services, it's stated in your leaflet that the Brooks Bus Service is going to start improving their services with later buses and weekend buses. How are you guys planning on implementing this? Um, we sit on um, various committees and subgroups and things, you know, I won't go into the nitty gritty details, They're, they are relatively boring things, but the fact we go and sit there for three hours and slog out what's working, what isn't working. If you compare it to the start of the year, I think most people would agree that the bus service has improved. Um, and talking about the decisions and, and which services need improving more, um, we have basically ensured that in future it should be you know, a lot better from day one. 
So for example, people who are coming from Slade Park at weekends won't have to wait an hour in between buses. There's going to be a much more frequent service, especially down Cowley Road as well. On the topic of transporting students around, the safety bus doesn't actually end up going all the way to places like Wheatley. So how are students going to be able to get the safety bus to them so that they can maybe come and enjoy stuff in the town centre from Wheatley or Harcourt? It's important to remember that the safety bus isn't a taxi service. It's a welfare service. It will bring students back to Wheatley. We don't want people stranded. We don't want people without money not being able to get home and have, uh, you know, sleep under a bridge or whatever just to keep warm. Um, you know, if people want to go into town, plan it early on. There's, there's plenty of buses that go down. You can have a bit of fun on the bus, no drinking. But, you know, there's no reason why you can't have a chat on there. Get into town early. Um, and then um, if, if you need to get back, get the safety bus back. Uh, Paul was also unable to respond about Brooks being voted one of the lowest student unions in the NSS. How do you, as the president, respond to this? It's... It's a bit of a poison chalice, you know, you can, there's 23 questions on the NSS and all third years will be hopefully answering it this year. Um, the university as a whole has 22 questions. We have one. It doesn't accurately reflect all the things we do. It simply says, how do you rate your students union? You know, good, bad, ugly, whatever. It, you know, we feel it's unfair and, and because, you know, people compare it to other students unions who have these massive buildings, they have uh, club nights, they, they run all the sports. Joe, we are going to have to cut you off there, but sure. uh, thank you very much for joining us Not in the studio. Problem. It appears that the university is trying to make some positive changes, but they still have a long way to go in order to change the way that many students view the Brooks Union. Well, one of these changes is the introduction of the Brooks Social Wall, which aims to improve the Brooks student experience. This may have been developed in response to the results of the National Student Survey. According to the students who answered the annual questionnaire, Brooks Union isn't fulfilling expectations. As a result, along with Oxford University, Brooks are ranked in the lowest five student unions in the country. We sent Dominic Yu to find out more about the Brooks Social Wall. Oxford Brooks recently launched a brand new social community providing social wall and blocks for students to share different medias and stories across the university. The social wall is a compilation of social media posts from Facebook, Twitter and other different networking services registered by Brooks, so that viewers can conveniently and easily receive information through posts. The Student Blocks is a platform for students to express themselves. There are now five regular bloggers sharing their different stories and life experiences at Brooks. Social and Digital Media Manager from Brooks, Tim Gibson, mentioned that the social wall provides a dedicated space to share the energy and vibrancy of Oxford Brooks. Also, it is exciting to have student bloggers to share their life experiences at university. Here are some opinions about the social community from students. Um, I think it's really good here at Brooks because all of the students from different societies and different areas of uh, the university subjects can all communicate together. Um, so we all know what each other are doing and we all feel much more you know, as a community as a whole. And uh, it was first time for me to see it. Um, I don't think that the promotion activity is enough. I don't think that uh, it's widely recognized among the students. So I think um, much more promotion activities are required. Since both of the social wall and the student blocks are currently on a beta stage, is it necessary that more promotions are needed for the social community? I'm Dominic Yu from Brooks TV News. Our mobile phones are something that we use each and every day. I know I certainly couldn't manage without my daily dose of Candy Crush Saga. And now thanks to the work of staff and students at Oxford University, you may have another use for yours. As well as the host of features on today's smartphone, it now appears that we may soon be using them instead of our credit cards. Isabel Zibbert reports. After years of research in the Oxford University Department of Computer Science, Professor Bill Roscoe developed a commercial venture. Oxford University, the centre of research. I'm now in front of the Wolfson building where Oxept 
the new payment app with an emphasis on security was born. The mobile app should replace the normal credit card or cash payments. I went to see Professor Roscoe's research assistant, Dr. Bangda Chen, to find out more. The name is Oxet. That is a combination between two words, uh, Oxford and Accept. Mm -hmm. So it represents the payment nature and also the Oxford brand. Our target is um, uh, for security concern users, of course, and also for um, small vendors, small merchants, temporary merchants, or individuals who want to sell something. The app should, for example, make it easier to order food in restaurants. Normally, you have to read the menu and order with a waitress. With the app, the user just authenticates the restaurant and can see an order list of the products of this restaurant. Once he has ordered and paid for his food with the app, the waitress will bring him his product. This should make payments much quicker and safer. But what does the public think about the payment app? I think it's quite a good idea because obviously you've always got your mobile phone on you. Um, sometimes you forget, you forget your wallet. Once you register, you don't have to go through the process of re-registering or always typing in your, your details over and over again? Uh, I think I would. It would depend if I knew people who other people who'd used it. Well, it'd be easier, but I'd probably trust the credit cards more, I think. Just paying online for something kind of sounds the same. Um, so I think, no, I, would, I think I'd be fine with that. Uh, security wouldn't bother me at all, uh, because uh, I'm not, I think security would be fine, but uh, I just wouldn't use such an app. Why is it better, though, to use the app rather than a credit card? Dr. Chen has some answers. If you use a credit card, there are many risks. For example, you need to hand it out to someone you do not trust. Use it on some devices you do not trust. So, in our way, we ask users to bind the bank account or credit card account to the phone, which the user trusts. Whether this new payment method will be accepted by the public will show itself with the soon release of the app. Isabel Zipper, Brooks TV. You know, I think they're onto something there. I always yeah. seem to forget my wallet, but I never seem to forget my phone. Yeah, I would be lost without my phone, but then if I lost my phone, I would lose my wallet as well. <laughs> I see. So. And now onto sports, and a rather inspirational story. Having a disability can often prevent people from taking part in physical activities. Organisations such as IWAS, the International Wheelchair and Amputee Sports Federation, are raising the awareness of alternative sports for those with a physical disability. Last weekend, reporter George Katesha met with the Oxford uh, City Amps football team to see how these athletes aren't letting their disability get in the way of their passion for the game. The National League of Amputee Footballers met here at Oxford City Football Club on Sunday where a four-way tournament took place with teams from Oxford, Lancashire and Merseyside, Manchester and London. The players play in teams of seven for 25 minutes each way. Each team is allowed unlimited substitutions and a handball is called when the ball strikes a player's crutch. The players, most of whom were wounded in conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, take the game very seriously and have dreams of making it to the Paralympic Games. However, despite there being events for blind players and those of cerebral palsy at the Games, amputee football is yet to be included. The England Amputee Football Association has applied to be included in the 2020 Paralympics in Tokyo. They are optimistic about their chances but still need more players to get involved. At the moment, when they're not involved because it's not a big enough sport and we've got to prove that we've got a, a national league going, which is what's happening today. And that it's a big enough sport that can be supported from, for the future as well as now. The International Paralympic Committee will meet at the Winter Games in Sochi in early March to check which of the sports and disciplines that have applied for inclusion meet the minimum criteria. They will be concluding their talks sometime in October next year and these players will find out if their Olympic dreams will become a reality. For Brooks TV, I'm George Kazacha. That's it for this week's show. Uh, but remember, you can view all our previous episodes on the Brooks TV YouTube channel, which you can find at youtube.com forward slash Oxford Brooks. And if you have a story that you want to contact us about, then you can get in touch with us at Brooks TV at brooks.ac.uk. Thanks for watching and remember to keep it locked to Brooks TV. Goodbye. Goodbye.